Today is September the 13th, 2021, and my name is Tanya Pincham. I'm with the Oklahoma State University with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program, and with me is Ben Pollard. He's a retiree from the Oklahoma Conservation Commission. We're in Oklahoma City to speak with Jimmy Emmons, pioneer and producer, soil health expert, former Dewey County Conservation District Director, and past president of the Oklahoma Association of Conservation Districts. 2017 through 2019. He's from Lady, Oklahoma, where the friendly people make the difference, and it's celebrating its 110th anniversary this year. And this year, Jimmy also became a member of the Oklahoma Conservation Con Commission team, serving in the role of soil health mentor mentoring coordinator. That's a mouthful. It is. It is. This will be part of our Oklahoma's Conservation Heritage Oral History Project, which is a collaboration between the Oklahoma Historical oh, Oklahoma Conservation Historical Society, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. So thank you for meeting with us today. Before we get into your conservation work, let's learn a little bit about you. Start wherever you want. Okay. Well, Jimmy Emmons, uh, Dewey County, Oklahoma. Uh, my family came to, to Dewey County in 1926. Uh, my great-granddad had uh, 13 children, uh, and they, at that time, were, were settled in uh, Mountain Park, Oklahoma, and quickly ran out of land as, as the kids grew up. And uh, so granddad loaded up uh, three brothers and uh, uh, two girls and headed north, and uh, they came to... Uh, our home place uh, you know, in the afternoon in, in 1926, uh, and the place was for rent. And so, granddad, great granddad, left my granddad uh, enough money to rent the farm for a couple of years and kind of got them situated and then headed on west uh, where my Uncle Marvin uh, settled south of Los Angeles uh, and had a farm there for many, many years, and then my Uncle Bascom went uh, to Yakima, Washington mm -hmm. in the apple business, uh, and then the two girls never were happy, so they came back to Oklahoma City here and uh, found husbands and, and lived here. So that's where our family uh, farm got started. I tell everybody I'm the third generation, uh, and that's actually just on the farm by my, my really ancestry uh, started. They came uh, to Ellis Island, two brothers. Uh, one wanted to be a farmer, one didn't know what he wanted to be. Uh, and so our side of the family tree went south to Virginia uh, and then to Alabama and then to Texas. Uh, and we have a lot of uh, relatives in Freestone County, Texas. And then my great granddad traveled from Freestone uh, County there like I said, in the southwest Oklahoma. The other brother uh, became a riverboat captain and wound up in uh, North Dakota. And there's actually a, a county uh, on the border of South Dakota and North Dakota called Emmons County. It was named after him because he opened up a, a port there and got started. And we did, weren't even aware of that history uh, until a few years ago. Uh, when a friend of mine discovered that county and we went up there and, and doing further research uh, found that uh, in his later life, James Emmons was his name, which was my dad's name, by the way, uh, made a big fortune, went to Denver to the gold mines to triple his fortune, uh, lost his fortune, uh, came back and ran the riverboat for a little while and then came in 1889 uh, for the land run in Oklahoma uh, and, and uh, actually is buried in Pawnee, Oklahoma at the cemetery there and, and we had kinfolk so they, the two brothers uh, separated and, and weren't in contact for many, many years and uh, then come back to be uh, really close to one another in Oklahoma. So then uh, I got married uh, 40 years ago, uh, the 25th of this uh, month, uh, to my wife, Ginger. Uh, we had one son, Bo, uh, which now is the director of the radiation department uh, at Mercy Hospital here in, in uh, Oklahoma City. Uh, started out as a radiation therapist, still treats 
patience uh, himself just to stay in tune and, and let everybody know that he still can do that. Uh, one grandson, uh, Owen. Uh, so it's uh, when we have one full-time employee on our farm. Uh, we've cut back some here in the last uh, year or two. Uh, we've got about 1,250 acres or so of farm ground and about 5,000 acres of rangeland that we operate uh, with Ginger and Carson and I. And uh, Carson, I, everybody thinks he, with everything I talk and travel, I mention him a lot, thinks he's my son. Uh, and actually, he's he's been with us now 14 years, and so I hired him in uh, high school. And we're very proud of Carson, and we, we do think of him as our second son, kind of. So uh, good family operation, and uh, it's been a really good journey. Uh, on the, we still have the, the home place there, and of course other properties as well. So 1926, so it's coming up on the 100th, yep. 100th year. Yeah. So let's back up. Where did you go to high school? So I went to Leedy High. And graduated when? Uh, in uh, 79, 1979. Okay. Uh, had plans to uh, go to Southwestern uh, Oklahoma State University, and then on to, to Stillwater. Uh, my dad got injured uh, the summer before I was to go uh, with, a, with a fall and a back injury and uh, uh, I stayed home to put the crops in in the fall and uh, never left, and, and which uh, was a really good deal in, in, the, in the short term uh, uh, because shortly after that my dad uh, got sick and uh, passed away about five years later uh, with cancer. And actually, that's part of the reason my son got into to cancer uh, treatment and stuff. My dad uh, had cancer of the mouth, and uh, back then, uh, radiation uh, wasn't as accurate mm -hmm. as it is today, and actually had some radiation poisoning in his jawbone and, and complications from that. And uh, that's part of the reason my son wanted to get into that field and be more dedicated and more accurate and uh, so it's uh, been a good blessing. So were you an only child or did you have? <laughs> that's, that's another interesting part of the Emmons history. Uh, I was the only child with my mom and dad. My mom uh, married at an early age and had three daughters and uh, her husband uh, was a Stigelman at that time and went quail hunting in uh, Kansas and uh, came back to the hotel, the, the little lodge for the evening and they were all cold and damp, it had been snowing and they turned the fire way up and uh, back in them days there was no safety uh, and uh, they burned all the oxygen out of the room and, and passed away. Uh, and so then my mom met my brother's dad uh, two or three years later. Uh, then my brother came along, Jesse uh, Cates and uh, then his dad fell asleep and hit a bridge uh, when Jesse was young and, and got pat and passed away. And then uh, my mom met my dad. So five kids, uh, three different uh, families, all to one. And mm. they always say I'm the most spoiled because my <laughs> oldest sister is uh, uh, just turned uh, uh, eighty, and uh, so there's a. 20 year difference. Spread there. Yeah. So big spread out. But anyhow. Did any of those go into the farming business? No, uh, they didn't. Uh, one of the unique things was my, my oldest sister married uh, a young man in, in Charlotte was 16 uh, when they got married, and he was in seminary to be a pastor. And so my brother in law actually married my mom and dad uh, so it's yeah keep it in the family yeah we're we're, we're a <laughs> unique or off the wall family so well while we're talking about a little bit of that family history when did tell us a little bit about ginger so ginger grew up uh, about seven miles from me uh, south of a little community called ray r-h-e-a oklahoma uh, a farm gal uh, one of two girls that jack and francis had uh, Jack and Francis got married when Francis was uh, 14 and my father-in-law was 17 
and had uh, Jackie nine months and five days later, and then a year, two years later, they had Ginger. And uh, so we were high school sweethearts, I guess you would say, and dated off and on, and then decided maybe not, and 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 uh, then maybe, and anyhow, we uh, married, uh, like I said, 40 years ago, uh, September 25th. And so we've been together a long time. I tell everybody most uh, criminals get a parole before 40 years. <laughs> that, uh, I'm a lifer, so. <laughs> Had you already made the decision to be going to farming yourself when she said yes? Oh yeah, I actually put my first wheat crop in at the age of nine uh, with an age on deer. My granddad rented me a, a small piece of the home place. Uh, and so I started uh, then in uh, my junior year, I went into the custom hay baling business and, uh, and bought a tractor and baler and uh, then bought my first new tractor uh, my senior year. Uh, wow. So, yeah, and then I got into the oil field and then built fence and different things. I've done a lot of things over the years. <laughs> so, but that farming's your first That That's the common, that's the common. Uh, I've always farmed and ranched uh, and done a lot of other things on the side. So, And your dad did too? He, he farmed? Yeah, my dad farmed all his life. He, he went in the Navy uh, for a short period uh, of time uh, following the uh, the war on a repair ship, uh, but then came back and farmed all his life. And so it always fascinated me. My, my dad and his brother uh, farmed about a thousand acres of, of wheat together and cotton at that time. Uh, and that was in the 50s, early 50s, 48 to about 52. Uh, and with two age on deers and, and over the years, and we, we farmed a thousand to two thousand acres at different times and it's always fascinated me that they were able to farm that much ground with with so little equipment uh, but they had two hired hands and dad run the night shift and they run 24 hours a day uh, pretty near non-stop so and that was the days before cabs and air conditioning oh, yeah. air conditioned cabs yeah yeah it's uh Lots have changed. Uh, I, I give a presentation about that exact same thing, how my granddad started uh, with one horsepower, uh, walking behind a, a horse, and then, of course, went to two horsepower, <laughs> uh, a team, and then wound up with his biggest tractor was a, a John Deere with a 25 horsepower. And, uh, and so I tell everybody that was granddad, and then dad started with 25 horsepower, wound up with 160 horsepower was his last tractor. Uh, I started with that age on deer, but actually we're at 380 horsepower uh, is our largest uh, tractor now. So that's how the farm has, has changed, but I actually don't farm much more than two or 300 acres, more than my dad and my, and my uncle or his brother did with two A's. So. Just Maybe we're less over, time. yeah, yeah, <laughs> lots less time, and that's allowed us to do a lot more and be more diversified as well. So you drove your first tractor when you were about nine, or well, younger than that. So yeah, I started on a, a eight in Ford, uh, helping my granddad pick corn. He had to start it, put it in gear because I couldn't, we didn't weigh enough to push the clutch in, and so. <laughs> I would pull up till he'd tell me stop, and I'd turn the key off, and <laughs> and, and then we'd go again. And, and uh, I still have that Ford. I need to get that redone, and I have my, my dad's uh, 1958 that I want to get restored. It actually ran uh, up until my dad passed away. We used it uh, right after the funeral to, to unload wheat. My sisters and brothers were all in, and I fired it up and offered wheat that day. And, then I got busy and it's set and uh, I need to re resume that history project. Did you, were you a John Deere guy or a, a particular? So we've, we've always, well, I'll say that my, my granddad started with McCormick F, F12 and F20 and then went to John Deere and uh, had a, a steel wheel to start with and then actually had the first rubber tire tractor in Dewey County. And, uh, uh, you know, when he, when he, 
He first traded his uh, team off, had mules at that time, uh, for the John Deere tractor. Uh, he traded it to a good friend in town. There was a local John Deere dealership, if you could believe that, in Leedy, uh, Noeb Wilson. And uh, Noeb was convinced that tractors were going to be short-lived, and so he was trading for horses and selling tractors and <laughs> about went broke because he had horses and mules that ate him out of house and home uh, and then finally had to give them away. Uh, but so then my granddad liked it so well, then he wanted to go to rubber when that came out and everybody told him you'd be stuck all the time you had to have steel and of course we know that that story uh, like a lot of myths over the years was proven wrong so <laughs> uh they had john deere then uh, until uh, a neighbor wanted to sell my dad a, a, a w9 uh, international and uh, dad always said that was the curse of the farm and he <laughs> swore he'd never have another international uh, but in 1979, on uh, Halloween, not Halloween, on uh, Valentine's Day, I, I'd taken Ginger out and coming home rather late. And when I come over the hill, I thought, oh, I'm really in trouble because the light's on. And, and normally that's never a good sign. <laughs> and uh, actually what it was was a, a small fire burning in the shop window. And when I pulled up, I realized that the shop was on fire. And uh, I ran in, woke the folks up. Uh, went out when I opened the door uh, to the shop, uh, it was just like an explosion. It was, the fire was almost snuffed out due to lack of oxygen, and there was a little crack in the window where the little orange flame was burning that I thought was a light. And when I opened the doors, got oxygen, and uh, we were able to get two pickups out, and then I was trying to get one of our new tractors with the cab and air, the first one we ever had, um out but it would start and die and start and die and then dad was hollering at me to get out and then shortly thereafter we were trying to figure out how to pull it out uh another tr the 3020 that that my dad had bought in 65 was sitting by the window and was on fire then uh, mm. the tire was the time we got that away from there and put out it was too late mm. so uh anyhow lots happens Farm insurance come in handy or not? Some, you know, but back then uh, it, it wasn't as important as we thought it needed to be probably. And uh, so my dad lost quite a bit of equipment uh, in that show. So then he went to buy a new tractor back. Uh, International was like 7000 I think, cheaper. And he bought a, a, a new International 1486 at that time. And, it was the biggest lemon that they ever made. And, and when that left, uh, we vowed that that wouldn't happen again. And so we've been green ever since. <laughs> so we bleed it. So. Well then, let's what, what, describe the farm to us. When you took it over versus now, just a little bit of some So uh, the, the, the home place, uh, my granddad and dad always had cotton in the bottom land. Uh, some alfalfa and then wheat, uh, and that was the typical. We raised a lot of dairy hay uh, up until about uh, probably six years ago, maybe. Uh, dairy hay was always a part of what we did, um, and so cotton was was king uh, up till after my granddad passed away. My dad passed away in a short period of time. Uh, and we stopped. It just it was too far to the gin. The local Leedy gin had closed, and the Butler gin was fixing to close, and uh, it was going to be haul cotton 40 to 50 miles, and we thought that was too far. And of course, nowadays that's not too far, and uh, we've thought about it. Uh, but Ginger and I talk things over, and if we can't put it through a cow or a combine, uh, that's all the equipment we have. That's what we want to do. So now we we raise about 14 different crops, not every year, but in a big rotation. Uh, so we have, you know, sunflower, sesame, grain sorghum, cow peas, soybeans, corn, wheat, rye, barley, triticale, uh, 
when I do this every time. I've, I've got so many now that it's, it's hard to... Uh, canola. Yeah, it, we do raise canola. Uh, we, we have not in, the rotation's fixing to come around to that. Uh, we've tried lots of different things as, as well, and, and some of them haven't worked, but uh, lots of cover crops in between all the cash crops as well. So it's, uh, even though we only farm 1,200 acres now, we're planting that at least twice a year, and sometimes three times part of it. Uh, depends on the, the window of cropping. Uh, so some of our crops we can grow in 45 to 60 days, and so that we can turn around and quickly do something else. We have two irrigation pivots on the home place. Uh, everything else is dry land. And how you keep up with all this spreadsheets or, or just in your head? <laughs> I'm notorious for just in my head. Uh, <laughs> I've got friends that just insist i got to do spreadsheets, but uh, we do have a, a, an accounting firm and a, a bookkeeping firm, Farm Data Services out of Stillwater. Uh, so they keep a running five-year average on everything. We do annual budgets and projections and uh, but yeah, I just kind of, I don't know, I'm, I'm blessed that way. So <laughs> I do keep more notes now on the phone than I, uh, I used to. I used to have a red book and I've always kept, I've got an archive of them. Uh, and so now technology has allowed me to get away from that. And now I have two phones with working with the commission as well. So. Uh, it's just more complicated, but it's easier. You get miles and miles from home. You can call for help now. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, uh, I don't know, it was uh, exactly what year, uh, and I'll remember this conversation the rest of my life. Uh, uh, Paul Clark, our NRCS uh, DC at that time, uh, came out to the farm to do some conservation practices and asked me if, uh, I, if I would ever be interested in being on the district board. And I said, well, I really had never really thought about it, but uh, we were always pretty heavy conservation minded. And I told him, yeah, I, I wouldn't be opposed to that. And uh, so that kind of planted a, a seed in my mind about possibility of being on the board. Uh, but as I stated earlier, I, I never went to college uh, and stayed farming, but I always wanted to, to really stay focused on education and, and, and try to uh, be motivated to, to study and do more. And so I was involved in a lot of things. I, I got involved in the, the Oklahoma Young Farmers Association at an early age. Uh, and then, kind of like everything else, I became more involved and was a district director and then wound up being the, the state president uh, for a while. And then I ran for national secretary and I'd done that for a couple years and then I was national president for three years. And then that led to a part-time job with them, being a program manager after I finally quit. We hosted a, a big convention here in Oklahoma in 2000. Uh, and then I went to work for him as a fundraiser and I raised funds uh, for the National Association for about three or four years. Um, and so that had kind of all passed and uh, one day I uh, opened up the Dewey County paper and there was an advertisement if you wanted to run for a district director position and I really didn't research all that out very well and, and I actually caused the, the one of the first uh, election processes uh, and, and raised quite a bit of controversy in, in, at the local district board. Uh, that's not the way they had envisioned me coming on board uh, but I was successful uh, in, in won that election and, and got started. Um, and so then I was traveling and was kind of interested in NACD, the National Association, and uh, I went to a conference in uh, New Orleans and I uh, heard this guy named David Brandt from Carroll, Ohio, and he had this gigantic radish held up and was showing it and talking about cover crops. And it really fascinated me. Uh, and he had 
had changed his soil quite a bit and was very, very good at speaking and uh, made a big influence on me. So I came back home and I knew something wasn't right. And uh, we had been no-tilling off and on uh, since 95. My, my dad passed away in 97. And uh, that was always a controversy with dad. He couldn't understand why we wanted to no-till. And, and so Ginger and I only done it on our uh, acres that we operated. And uh, But we'd reached a plateau, and this was probably in about 2000. It just wasn't working right, but I continued on. I just, I wouldn't give up. Uh, then in uh, 2009 is when I heard David talk. So I'd, I'd stayed with it several more years, but we just, the ground was getting hard and we couldn't figure out why. And we were thinking about, and we were still plowing some at that time as well. And uh, so I, uh, I decided let's make this cover crop. This this may be what I'm missing, and uh, so I reached out to my local district board and said, you know, I'm thinking about this. I'd like to do this, but I don't know how to do it. Uh, would you guys be interested if you know working together if we could figure this out? Of course, they were all yeah. If you want to be the idiot to try it, you know, <laughs> go ahead. And, and Paul was very good, and Colita was very good at the district. Uh, to encourage me and so then I reached out to Gary O'Neill which was the acting state conservation at that time and was was what I thought would be a great pick for the next one and, and he wound up being and I asked him if, if NRCS would help me uh, do this if I would make my farm a pilot uh, farm to, to demonstrate a demonstration farm and uh, I reached out to the commission and noble research and everybody was, yeah, let's do this. And so we started a fantastic team and I planned my first cover crop uh, uh, the following year. And uh, then of course the drought came in 11 and 12. And uh, we, it was, it was just like the stars were aligned. Uh, we were measuring water because I had to prove to myself uh, and ginger, uh, that we weren't going to use too much water with cover crops. That was the big thing on limited rainfall that you always, in the back of your mind, if you can barely grow a crop, and we still battle that today uh, uh, as I'm teaching and traveling across the country. Uh, people don't think you can do that. But we had uh, moisture probes and, and temperature probes out uh, in plots, the, the district and the NRCS was helping me with and during the drought we quickly found that we were having more water at the end of the growing season with cover crops than if we were back bare fallow soil. It was a big big game changer for us at Emmons Farms and I knew I was on to something and I knew that uh, we had great possibilities down the road. So we started cover crops uh, and then about uh, two years in, uh, Steve Allspaugh, Greg Scott, my, uh, with the commission soil scientists, started pushing me to graze these cover crops and to rotationally graze them, to put up poly wire and fencing and small paddocks. And that was a huge uh, decision. I, I'm normally pretty fast on the draw if I think it's got merit and I can make some money at it and, it, and the numbers look good. Uh, the, the big hurdle then was Ginger and Carson uh, because by then I had started speaking and, and traveling some and that was quickly growing and uh, I, at OS also in OACD uh, I got started in an area uh, director and then had became a uh, uh, vice president and then became state president as well and so lots of traveling lots of men gone and ginger's like who's going to do this if you if you do this and uh, i said well we'll figure it out and so we started uh, bigger uh, paddocks and, and longer rotational times and 
to accommodate that. And uh, we quickly learned that that was easier once we got set up than we thought. And uh, so then that went, we started our really good rotational. And we still today, uh, we're weaning calves right now on cover crops uh, and fence line weaning. Everybody at home is worried about planting winter wheat to graze right now and it's dry and, and none's been planted and everybody's fearing that they're not going to have fall pasture and I'm like I've got cover crops that's head high mm -hmm. uh, that we're grazing right now and that will last uh, until we hopefully get winter pasture coming on in November or something so we've closed the gap on 365 grazing we like to have something green and growing in front of the cattle 365 if we can you know mother nature doesn't always allow that uh, and so uh, that is a challenge at times but most of the years we can do that if we manage right it's a uh, a big this part of cover cropping is management and and knowing being aware of your moisture and how much you have and terminate early if you need to to save some water if you're going to plant another crop or if you've got extra water let it grow and and utilize that uh, so it's not quite shake and bake one two three easy as as a lot of people sell it to be uh, but once again nowadays farming and ranching is about management my, my dad and granddad always told me all you got to do son is work hard the harder you work, the more successful you're going to be. And I found that was true up to a point. And then all at once is like, it didn't matter how hard I worked or how many hours I put in, I didn't make any more money. Economics had changed, times had changed. And uh, still today it is, is not true. It, the work ethic is true. You, you, you work, but you can't just continually plow. And back then, when granddad and dad were alive, the more they plowed, the better it was. Now we know that they were farming the carbon out of the soil and uh, and they never would have done that if they'd had any clue that they were degrading the land. I, I believe that a thousand percent uh, because they cared about the land. Uh, one of my earliest recollections of conservation in the in the family farm was we the the family original homestead was along the south canadian river six miles below camargo and my granddad had about 250 acres of, of farmland possible farmland there he never actually farmed at all because he didn't have the horsepower to, to farm at all and couldn't get it done and some of it was real sandy and he chose not to farm that because when he did it tried to blow and uh, but water was always a problem coming out of the gypsum hills across going to the river and uh, so when granddad came in, in 1926 and I somewhere in about the late 20s uh, he had this idea to take the walk and plow and, and plow a ditch across the field uh, to divert the water straight to the river instead of spreading it out over the farm ground. And uh, that worked very well, uh, he said, uh, in a short period. But in 1934, in the, in the middle of the night, uh, became a historic rainfall that they called the Hammond Flood. A uh, small town south of us, about 17 miles, uh, experienced about anywhere from 14 to 16 inch rainfall overnight and lots of loss of life on the Washita River. Uh, and it actually washed the creek out uh, on our fi family farm, that small ditch uh, to where the bridge uh, that goes to my folks' house uh, is, is about 40 some foot wide and about 25 foot deep overnight. It was just mm -hmm. gone. And, and my granddad never, ever, ever forgot that. Uh, and what he caused, uh, he thought, and which we all know now that amount of water it was going to make it where there's a little ditch there or not. Uh, he just basically made the direction of the creek. 
Uh, and so he told us, you know, we've got to watch what we do because everything we do has a consequence. And I, and I talk about that in my talks now, that no matter what we do on the land, there is a consequence and we have a choice to make it a positive one or a negative one. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe that. So that was always in the back of my mind, you know, how we take care of it. And uh, over the years, we've done lots of conservation things from Terracing and for a while I was in the construction business uh, as well, had dozers and so we, we built terraces and ponds and uh, lots of things across the county. So conservation has always been a very strong background uh, uh, that it's a natural fit for us because we know that if we don't preserve it and, and take care of it and conserve it, uh, nobody else will. And, and we want it at, at least as good or better than, than we took it. And now we believe that we're going back and making it as good as it was uh, when my granddad came. Uh, one of the things that I have uh, in my possession that I, I found very unique was uh, in 1888, uh, uh, there was a, dry, uh, a drover came up the Great Western Cattle Trail, which actually comes through our property uh, and going to the small town of Trail, uh, which was named after the trail. Uh, of course, the, the cattle trails went from east to west in Oklahoma. The Chisholm Trail and stuff mainly went up Highway 81 here. And as settlement in Kansas grew and cropping started to growing as well, they had to move the cattle trails further west to keep them off the farmer's crops in Kansas. And so the Great Western Cattle Trail come through our property and uh, a truck driver for Western Equipment uh, told me one day, and he was wanted to come and walk the trail. He was a history teacher before he became a truck driver. and was very fascinated about the cattle trail and wanted to walk it. And uh, you can see, you can still see the cattle trails on our property, especially if you know where they're at. By aerial, you can really see them. So Dusty walked that, and when he got done, he uh, he told me, he said, you know, I've, I've got this journal from this drover that came up the trail with 3,000, three herds of 3,000. So he had 9,000 head, but in three different groups. And he kept a daily log from the time he left San Antonio, Texas, till he got to Ogallala, Nebraska. And, you know, some days he might write a short paragraph, some days he might write a half a page. Depends on, you know, how long a day he had and what the weather was like. But in that journal, he talked about crossing the Red River, the Washita River, floating the wagons across, and the cows swimming. And I could follow every little stream he talked about and then he got to a place in there, he talked about the gypsum ravines uh, before entering the Canadian Valley. And, and I knew then he was right where he was. He was on our property in the gypsum hills going into the, the riverbed where we farm. And uh, he talked about the grass being anywhere from stirp to, to saddle horn high for the cattle where they grazed. And, uh, that's always been a goal of mine to, because that told me that that was very rich soil, very high carbon, uh, very quality uh, soil. And uh, so I, that's part of my regeneration project is to, to get that back to that. And I think we're, we're getting there. Uh, it's, it's uh, coming along very well. It, it's, it's actually, so well that NRCS this past year has uh, reclassified my soil now uh, from the original classification uh, and partly because of the high carbon that we've entered back into that and the color change. So it went from a very light sandy loam, sandy to sandy loam soil uh, in the original classification to a, a dark colored uh, soil that's very high carbon. So now they call it a mollic uh, 
half the soil, I believe is the word. So uh, we're pretty proud of that. Uh, only David Brandt and myself had been recognized by NRCS to do that across the country. There's literally dozens to a hundred people or maybe more that's done that, uh, but has not been recognized for that either. They don't have a really good relationship with their partners or, or sometimes the agency doesn't see things the way they should as well. Uh, but we're very proud of the, the fact that we've started this partnership. And one of the things about, I can say about the Oklahoma partnership is it's very, very strong compared to lots of other uh, parts of the country uh, that NRCS and the commission and the OACD work very, very close together to move conservation forward. And it's been a pretty uh, cool to be a, a part of that. There's so many pieces to the puzzle. I mean, you've got, <laughs> you've got to be willing to, to do, a scientist has to find the knowledge and share it. And how do you sell that to your neighbors? You know, neighbors are the hardest. <laughs> uh, I can go 50 or 100 miles from home and, and they sometimes jokingly call me an expert. I'm really not an expert, but uh, locally, you know, you're the nut <laughs> that, that the farm looks weedy or trashy. I, I hear trash farming all the time. Uh, and, and it is compared to what people are normally, you know, the thing about people in general is we're very creatures of habit. Uh, animals are very, you know, creatures of habit. Uh, this whole world was built on that habits and, and habits are very hard to break. Uh, it, you know, in her local church, everybody has their spot, has their pew and, and, uh, you don't infringe on someone's pew. It's the same thing in conservation in, in neighbors. Uh, they grew up much like I did with the history. You need to plow more. If you have a weed, it's using nutrients, it's using water. It's, it's, it's horrible. You need to plow it. Uh, and, and basically, you know, God's telling us that we need to keep it covered and I'm going to cover it with something, whether you are or not. And if you fight me, I'm just going to keep trying to cover it more. And, uh, I've, I've finally decided that, but we can't impose our will on our friends and neighbors. And I don't want to, uh, I try to lead by example and, and just tell our story. And, uh, if people want to listen, uh, and ask for help, I'll, I'll help anybody uh, work with them to try to achieve that. Uh, I catch a lot of neighbors uh, looking in my fields <laughs> that, that don't want to be caught. And after I stop the time or two, I quickly learn not to try to insult someone by stopping and, and being the expert. Just let them look and if, and if they want to, they'll reach out and several have. Uh, we have several in the community, no-till and now s several try and cover crops. Some that's not working out as well. Some went back to plowing just because they didn't figure out the, the system. It's, it's a total systems approach and you got to think that way. You can't, and you got to treat a cover crop like a cash crop. Uh, and most people don't want to do that or can't accept that. Uh, thought process and once we did it got easier do you find it that it's the younger generation that's more willing to take risks or the older you I know I wouldn't guess but well it's neither neither it's the women we and I, I've, I've noticed this uh, I've been very blessed as I, I, I talked about traveling I, I've been in about 24 states now uh, at conferences talking about cover crops and uh, most generally, I see women shaking her head, poking the husband, pointing, 
up here and I, I got in a big discussion on Facebook about a year, maybe a year and a half ago now about women in ag and how innovative and how open to change they are. And, uh, and, I, and I see that uh, personally and, and so I know it's true. And I, and I think it's just part of, of that gender that, that have grown up trying new recipes, trying new clothes, uh, repainting the house, redecorating the house. Uh, a man, and I can say this because I'm, uh, I'm like this, he wants steak, potatoes, white walls, you know, we don't need to change. You know, er, this is working, we're content. Uh, so I see women uh, first, we have a lot of, of, of women now, or probably the growing number uh, of owners of land, just due to typically a lot of times they outlive their husband. Uh, and I see a lot of younger women going into ag uh, themselves, uh, even before they get married. Then we see the, the next generation of the younger uh, is, are always looking to do something more technology, the coolest, latest things. Uh, and so I see that then is the next step that's coming. Uh, I think that's what we're missing in conservation is, is uh, first of all, uh, really taking advantage of talking to the, the ladies of agriculture uh, because they're very open. I think the youth is the next one that we really need to focus on. Uh, also on a, the board of no-till on the plains, and that's our new uh, initiative there is try to engage the youth uh, and how we get the local science uh, class out, not only the FFA or the 4-H, but the science class because we now know that biologically uh, active soil is better soil and there's more to it than, than we all know. And there's a deep part of that science that we're missing. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that's our next uh, revolution or evolution into uh, uh, soil health is really understanding that and getting the youth to understand that. Uh, about two years ago, I had this young man named Drew Ewing uh, reached out to me and he was a grad student at Clemson University and he was studying biology and microbiology at that time and uh, he was very interested about coming to the farm because what he was being taught at Clemson really wasn't what Jimmy and several others were talking about on YouTube and I have lots of videos out on YouTube as well and, and he wanted to come and understand if what I was talking about was a forest or make-believe or a myth or it was really something to it. come to find out uh, his granddad grew up uh, and had a family farm over by Watonga and uh, but his dad had left and they went to Kansas and everybody got, and got scattered out uh, but they they wanted to come back to the visit the family farm but they wanted to come out to our place I said, sure. And so they came in, in January 4th, uh, very cold. And uh, so I took Drew to uh, a place at my house, which is about four or five miles from our home place, our headquarters. And I showed him something that we'd been working on for about four years at that time and, and how the color was changing. Uh, and we can see about a, an inch a year in a good systems approach of darkening carbon moving down. There's a big debate if that's new soil, if is it growing up, uh, you know, we really think that it's reloading of the carbon moving down. Uh, we're not necessarily building topsoil, but you, we actually kind of are because you're, you're rebuilding, regenerating what you've degraded. Uh, and then I took him to a neighbor's farm uh, to a dairy west of our house uh, that is uh, they graze out everything they're in heavy tillage good good family farm good family friends uh, 
that believe that what they're doing is right and, and that's that's their you know right to think that and and they do a good job of what they do uh but our soil at the house was just about froze a quarter inch deep that day uh and once you got to digging in it it was warm drew talked about that over there the soil was very cold it was froze down about five or six inches uh, and then i took him to the our first field the longest end and it was actually warm and no frost and um, so when he got ready to leave uh, two things happened drew and i talked pretty much in depth about the biological world and and in that component uh, and we talked about a lot of other things as well uh, but his dad said before we leave Jimmy <clears throat> in layman's terms tell me what we saw today which I'm pretty good at common lay, layman terms uh, because I, I just don't have the education to talk that deep sometimes and I told him I said well the first field we went to was like a gymnasium that had been setting uh, in the winter, and we're in January, and the coach decided to have basketball practice, uh, turn one heater on, and here come the boys and the girls to practice. And as long as you're running and, and, and working out, you know, it's comfortable. It wasn't hot, wasn't cold, just kind of comfortable. The second field we went to was a gymnasium that had been closed all winter and no one was home and when you went in it was very cold uh, the third field we went to the longest field in for us was they were having a basketball tournament and the fire marshal said there's no more can come in and actually you had to turn the fans on to keep it cool because there was so much body heat and so much activity going on and, and all that is the biological community and the more you have, the more heat they generate, the more water they generate. You know, for for three years, it was three of my friends across the country, one in North Carolina, Russell Hedrick, one friend uh, in, out in uh, the western Kansas and Oklahoma panhandle, Nick Voss, and I all three saw spikes in our water probes in the early spring. We knew it wasn't coming from below because our moisture probes were 40 inches deep. We knew it wasn't coming from above because it hadn't rained. And the probes will tell you that it's just in about a four to six inch layer. And none of us could figure it out. And, and we talked about it and we asked lots of people. And finally, Dr. Chris Nichols, uh, a good friend of mine now, uh, a world renowned scientist, told me, said, well, Jimmy, that's easy. What gas do you exhale the most of? And all three of us said CO2. It's actually water vapor. And that's the reason you dehydrate even though you're not sweating sometimes and why, how important it is to drink water all the time. Uh, and as that biological community wakes up in the spring and gets active and goes to working and feeding, that's the reason it gets damp or moist in that profile. So then Drew got ready to leave with his dad and he said, Mr. Emmons, what an eye opener. And I want you to talk to our professors at Clemson and, and, and would you be willing to work with them? In which I had several conversations with them. Uh, and he said, how else can I help you? And I said, Drew, if you could just write in your own terms, a page or so of what you saw today that I could share and I do I still share that to this day in my presentations uh, it's been very very helpful one of the greatest rewards uh, I got out of that whole conversation was uh, after school Drew contacted me and he was very fascinated about being in conservation and was wanting to find a job and I tried to help him in a couple of scenarios, uh, companies and different things that would fit his field uh, that didn't quite work out. And there was always a reason things don't work out. Um, I'm so excited to, to, to be able to tell you that he's went to work at Stillwater 
uh, for the NRCS. Uh, we went to work for Gary uh, now, and he's going to be a great asset because he does get it. He's the next generation, you know. Uh, so been very, very blessed uh, to uh, have a lot of that type of activity on the farm. Well, and your your outreach is not just in Oklahoma. Then it sounds like it goes across across the country and even out outside of the country, maybe. Yeah, uh, we we have we haven't traveled abroad near as much as we want to. We got shut down over the last couple of years. We were scheduled to go to Australia and speak. Hmm. Uh, we we've been invited uh, to England to speak. Uh, and then, of course, the virus has, has detailed, put off, postponed some of that. We virtually spoke uh, all across the country. Uh, one of the one of the things I really want to talk about, and it'll lead back to this conversation, is kind of a big circle, as you figured out. I've got lots of circles. That's good. Uh, we were, things were really going very well for us uh, at home and, and speaking and, and traveling. And we were very, very blessed to be uh, the first recipient of the Leopold Award in Oklahoma. 2017. Yep. And uh, so the ceremony was to take place uh, in the spring of 18 uh, in April. And so we came down. And, and what a day. I mean, it was a, it was a great day. Uh, we were able to go over to the Senate floor, uh, be recognized in, in the chamber there, and, and actually speak uh, to the senators about that. Carson was with us. Uh, Ginger was with us. My son and him came for the ceremony. They, being in the medical field, can't always get off in a timely manner. Um, and so, I'd promised Ginger because by that time in my life, my life had got very, 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 very busy. And a lot of people across the country uh, were emailing me after I spoke at a conference. And at that period, uh, it, was, it was quite common to have you know, 100 to 300 emails a day asking, you know, I'm trying this, what do you think? Different scenarios. And lots of phone calls as well. And I, I promised Ginger that I would turn my phone on silent and, mm -hmm. and, and not answer uh, anything that day. And, and so during the ceremony, uh, my phone started buzzing and it just wouldn't quit. And uh, so I got through the ceremony and give kind of a, uh, an address a little bit, I guess you might say, of my acceptance. And uh, we sat down to eat lunch. I, I just couldn't resist it anymore. And I looked, and it was our neighbor and our friend uh, saying there's a wildfire, and it was on our property, and uh, that we needed to come home. And so we quickly uh, bowed out and uh, left and drove, I was telling everybody, 90 miles an hour home uh, with the flashers on to, to a horrendous fire. And, uh, that fire uh, lasted nine days, uh, burned about 300 and some thousand acres in Dewey and a little in Major in Woodward County, uh, half of Dewey County. They evacuated every uh, town uh, in, in Dewey County except Levy, and they thought they were going to have to, but they didn't. Uh, and so it was very, very devastating period in uh, their noble research made a video uh, on us and it's called from, uh, out of uh, uh, out from the ashes what it's called I get a little emotional so I got I gotta be careful here uh, and it is still kind of hard to watch but uh, what we found uh, that we were able to put the fire out where we had managed our cedars with our conservation on the home place of all places. The Ray fire started at one and a half miles from our headquarters to the east. Uh, and the neighbors to the east had not controlled cedar trees. Uh, a lot of them absentee farm owners, uh, 
but we were able to make a fire break uh, quickly where there was no trees and were able to keep the home place from burning. Uh, now from there on, uh, it was a bigger challenge. So on about day three, uh, we were out east. A lot of the wind kept shifting back and forth and changing. And so fires would start back up. Uh, we were trying to move a set of cows out of a place that was burning. Uh, and that same neighbor called, they were in the construction business as well, and asked Ginger and I what we wanted out of the house where we live. And it's like, well, there's no fire over there. The fire's out here. Well, the winds were gusting about 50 to 60 that day, mm. and the high lines had arced south of our house and started another fire. And uh, it's like, okay. We'll try to get back that way. Well, the, the patrol had done closed. We didn't know because we were in the smoke and fire down on the river, like I said, trying to get cows out. And we we, we finished that project and saved them cows uh, before we left to come back to the house. And then by then, the patrol had shut the highway down and we couldn't get back. But actually, the wind shifted. Uh, so about 100 yards south of the house, that the my friend that has lots of bulldozers and road graders had told his hands not to let her house burn and that my calc and they had done a wonderful job and the wind changed and it just turned right in front of the house so saved her house uh, which was a very good blessing i, I lost a couple of landlords houses and, and, and one of our shops on a rented property with equipment in it. One of the things though that, that we did learn, uh, we had planted rye that fall prior to in 17 on about a thousand acres and it had laid dormant and never germinated for 118 days. I, and I tell a lot of people this, it was my first total failure cover cropping. I thought it was a total failure. Uh, it turns out it wasn't a total failure because early in the spring we caught a little dab of snow and it germinated and we caught a little shower or two in the last of March and early April and so the rye was about this tall two or three inches green uh, when the fire happened and so we were able to save about half of our cow herd by putting them on the green rye Mm. Uh, my greatest failure turned out to be, you know, part of the greatest savior. Mm. Gotta stop. Okay. So you know, our our, our greatest failure become uh, the greatest savior to help save the cows. Now a lot of the residue did burn. We had some fields, and I vowed uh, because I fought so much sand and blowing dirt in my early years in the cotton patch in the spring that. Once I started this cover crops and all this great Jimmy M and soil health renovation, rejuvenation that my land would never blow. And, and you know that old saying that and my granddad always said never say never. So we had a lot of, of wheat and rye that was this tall that actually had high, high residue in it, did burn. Uh, and, and some of the fields didn't completely burn and the cows were able to get in that field uh, we think that's probably by design if they knew where to go and somebody was probably telling them where to go. But a lot of that land then blew for several days before we got enough rain to plant another cover crop uh, back. So a very, very challenging time, uh, that window through there. My district board directors were hit heavily. Every, every one of us uh, had fire and, and damage. Uh, Ken Salisbury lost his family home, his mother's home, shop, and a lot of collectible antique tractors. Uh, Roger Moore lost most of his registered cow herd. Uh, Dale Wilson burnt right around his house, lots of property. Jimmy Purvine didn't have the extent the rest of us did, but did have fire. Uh, of course, they evacuated Tologa and the district 
office building several times during that period. Uh, so very trying time. About probably three weeks, give or take a little bit there. It's I tell everybody it's, my mind was still a little smoky. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Congressman Lucas called me, and, and Frank and I are about five, six months difference in age, five and a half actually. Uh, and been very good friends over the years and a big supporter of his and uh, called me and said the Undersecretary of Agriculture, Bill Northey, and I are coming to Oklahoma and we'd like to come out and tour some of the fire damage. Could you set us up a lunch and a place to eat and then we'd like to tour? And, uh, you know, in the back of my mind, I was saying, well, sure, Frank, I've, I've only been half burned out and, <laughs> and I've got 20 miles of fence laying on the ground and I don't have time. But being Jimmy and doing what we do, I said, sure, I'd be honored. And, and so West Farm Credit Western Oklahoma stepped up, furnished us a meal, Western equipment. Uh, Harry Clinton had corporate headquarters, had a huge, nice room for us all to eat, donated that. I had met uh, Bill Northey, the undersecretary in the NACD in my travels with the conservation districts when he was secretary of ag and ag in Iowa. And I was a big Bill Northey fan because he had really promoted cover crops in Iowa and then actually got incentives built into their uh, program there to help farmers plant cover crops. And so I'd met Bill at a couple of conferences and actually at an NACD, uh, not a luncheon, but a, a, the reception uh, in D.C. Uh, prior to him being uh, nominated or appointed to the undersecretary. And we had a great conversation there. So I then had that acquaintance. So Bill came and, and, and Frank came and we toured our place and some landlords that had lost their houses and some barns. We uh, went to uh, Roger Moore's church there at Camp, on Camp Creek, met Ken and uh, Salisbury and Roger there. News 9 was there. And, and uh, so it was a sad day, a very emotional day, but a good day that, that people from Washington was interested and in, in wanting to know what they could do. And, uh, when we got ready to uh, depart and, and Bill was going on west to Canadian that night, uh, he asked uh, our locals, uh, you know, what had they had turned in for emergency money, ECP money at FSA. And, and, and Michael had, had said, you know, I, I put in for a million dollars. And I had this puzzled look and I kind of quick turn. And uh, the state director at that time uh, uh, said, I'm, I'm marked that out. We put in for two or three more million. And I quickly just looked at Frank and, and, and the undersecretary and said, that's not near enough. And, and, you know, what do we need to do if we need more? And uh, I didn't mean anything by it to, to Michael or, or Scott Biggs, the state director. Uh, I never intended to hurt their feelings, and I hope I didn't. But I just knew it was, we were going to need a lot more. And so Bill asked me, he said, what do you, what do you need? I mean, what, how much do you think we need? I said, I don't know, half the county burned. And I probably said something derogatory. I don't, I don't know, you know, like millions. And uh, so Bill said, I want to keep in touch with you. Uh, Here's my email and we'll have visits. So when the first round of ECP fencing bill come into the office, is it 12.5 million, mm. uh, just the first round. And then uh, Paul told me that NRCS was requesting about 10 uh, million for equip and everything. And so I relayed that directly to the undersecretary then. And he said, that's, that's great. He said, actually, when I got back to headquarters, I requested a, a big chunk because I knew you guys were going to need it. Uh, fast forward to about May, uh, his chief of staff called me and said, we'll set up a call to talk to you. And I thought it was going to be about 
the fire, the money had came. We were in round two of some equip and some different things. And so when he called, and uh, this is one of them days, and Frank Lucas talks about this, there's days in history that you remember forever. You know, whether it be JFK getting killed, the war, 9-11, they're just things that, well, this is going to be one of them for Jimmy. Because I stopped spraying, I was on a hill where I could have cell phone service. <laughs> uh, and the undersecretary came on and, so I had all my notes prepared mentally and in my phone about the dollars that we needed and had spent. We, as Jimmy normally does, I rattled a little bit and, and trying to stay on point. And then Bill said, well, that's really not why I called. You know, I, I'd like for you to put in for the chief of NRCS and be a part of my team. Well, after dropping the phone and I literally <laughs> I literally dropped the phone. I was so shocked and, and caught off guard. And, and I could hear him saying, Jimmy, Jimmy, I said, yeah, <laughs> I'm here. Dropped the phone. Uh, and I tried to talk him out of that because of my lack of education, number one. And he said, Jimmy, what I want is somebody that has practicality, common sense, and has the fortitude to do what needs to be done. So after some big deliberation with the family members, and I told Bill I'd need about a week, uh, I decided to pursue that uh, and, and come in in second place, which I tell everybody I'm so thankful. Uh, really not. I mean, I, it, was a, it was quite an opportunity. But as soon as that door closed, he opened another one and said, we got this regional coordinator position uh, that we just created. There'll be 10 of you. You'll have three states. Uh, would you be interested? And, and now I went through all this interviews, personal interviews, one-on-one -on -one in D.C. with the secretary and undersecretary for the chief's job. Uh, and it's like, well, what do I got to do? He said, say yes. And so I said yes. Uh, and then wound up there were only eight of us. So I had five states. I had Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, uh, Colorado and Kansas as and I would be over the over is not the right word I would have the three agencies the NRCS FSA and uh, RMA uh, to assist them in trying to work together as one uh, to uh, listen to farmers if the programs and ranchers and foresters if the programs were working for them or if we could change them you know, how could we change that? How could we help offices? Uh, and it, the list goes on and on. And so I was very blessed to do that job. And it's all back to being part of the conservation family that, that opened them doors. And so even though my, my education wasn't far from home, it was really been pretty abroad mm -hmm. as well. And so pretty, pretty proud of, uh, of what I've been able to accomplish with that and just you know my dad always tell me told me that you need to be at the right place at the right time and you never know that and so don't ever turn down an opportunity and uh, so that uh, that led us there and so that was a uh, it took a fire and being burned out in the Leopold Award and a connection to a congressman to get to be a presidential appointee and uh, very blessed and uh, still has some opportunity in that in the future here. Uh, so we'll see how that, that plays out if it ever does. If it doesn't, we, it's been a, a, a very a huge honor and a privilege to serve uh, our nation in that, in that role. So that's, that's been a pretty good accolade for us. I keep thinking when you're telling that story that you're building bridges between, you know, knowledge and farmers and all that, and thinking your granddad would be proud. Mm -hmm. You know, his may have washed, the bridge may have washed away, but you have come in and, yeah. you know, replaced yeah. or helped build a lot of those back. You know, we think about that a lot. I, I rented a farm uh, from a, a high school classmate's parents, parent, 
uh, the husband that passed away. Actually, her brother, two years older than us, passed away first, and then the dad passed away both to cancer. Uh, and so I started, she wouldn't rent me the farm unless I plowed it the way that they, her husband had always had. And I told her I, I would in respect, but I'd really like to do no-till and stuff. Uh, but it actually connected a bunch of our properties together and it was hard not, I just couldn't pass it up. The first year we had rotation of canola in there and I had, I had it slicked off just like I'd been taught by granddad and dad and God sent us a big six inch rain and it oh my gosh it washed ditches and sediment clear across the, the road into where I was no-tilling and it all just right in and I'll never forget and, and her mother was in her upper 70s at that time and, and she said Jimmy, you've convinced me. Uh, I don't want to give my farm away to you. Uh, and I give a chunk away this past week, and, and I see what you've been able to do. So we've been no-tilling that and, and multiple crops on that property ever since. One day, they came by, the, the daughter and the mom and the son-in-law, and I was planting uh, wheat into a cover crop that was almost as tall as the cab of the tractor. <laughs> And they drove by, and it just it, it, that thought popped in my head. You know what would Ira, her husband, <laughs> you know think of that? Because he was always a, a excellent farmer, excellent farmer, very clean, no weeds, had terraces, tried to maintain you know erosion. And they didn't text me back. And it's like sometimes you don't want to know the truth, and sometimes you shouldn't <laughs> ask if you don't want to know the truth. But I was very patient. In about two hours, the, the text finally came through and said, and this is one of them things you don't forget, Jimmy, we've had an extensive conversation about that. My dad, this was the daughter talking, my dad always had the goals that he never wanted his land to wash away or blow away. We think you're accomplishing that. We don't know that dad would understand what you're doing today. But once again, you're accomplishing the goals that he set out for us to maintain mm -hmm. the farm. Keep on doing what you're doing. Yeah. So, but that's, you know, we think that a lot. You know, how would, how would dad think, you know, we're doing, how would granddad think? I, I think in the end, I think they would be complimentary of what we've been able to do. Would they understand some of the things that we've done or the things we're doing and the companion cropping and the relay cropping that we're doing now? Probably not. But once again, I remember conversations between my dad and my granddad about, you know, more equipment and trying to plant another crop or a different crop and that, that generational pressure and change that I talked about creatures of habit. That's uh, very, very hard to, to change. Uh, I tell one quick story about our church. One time I was invited to be a chairman of this committee about how we we might mix things up at church and make you know make the youth happy. Uh, how how we might change the way we're doing things. And so I proposed what I called a backwards Sunday. I thought it was a very simple con. If you sat on the front left row, <laughs> you would sit on the, the right rear row, and I just X, just, just shuffled it. Uh, I'm no longer on that committee after one <laughs> week. <laughs> I found that one of the things you don't mess with is people's habits of, of their pews and stuff. Uh, but I thought it would stretch everybody and, 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 you know, maybe we could grow within. And that gets back to what I, what we do at the farm now is what we try to do that. One of the things that's made Ginger and I really successful over the 40 years is, is not my intelligence uh, or any of that. It's, it's, I'm the sail that, that unfolds and wants to go 
from zero to as fast as the boat will go. Ginger is the anchor uh, that says, Jimmy, wait a minute. Uh, are you sure we want to do this? You know, are you sure this will work? And I quickly learned that, you know, we can't both be the sail or we would crash and burn. And we both can't be the anchor. Or we'd never leave the port. It takes a combination of both of that to make a successful journey. So I think that's probably where we're at traveling through life is that balance between not as fast as we can go, close, <laughs> uh, but also the ability to pull back and say, wait a minute. Do you have these conversations around the dinner table or on across the field on cell phones? Uh, you know, Ginger and I used to talk a lot about conservation and cover cropping and stuff, and she'll tell you if you ask her today that she's heard me speak so many times <laughs> and, and, and preach so many times uh, that, that we try not to talk about that at the dinner table. Okay. Uh, but, but yeah, we, we, we have conversations about that. We're, we're trying to move into the next phase now of grazing better. Uh, we've been doing an excellent job, I think, on our cover crops, but our native range is more challenging. Very rolling hills, water's not everywhere, uh, time is a factor. Uh, we know that's where we need to go. Uh, I want more diversity in animals. I wanted some poultry. I got some friends that run free range chickens and turkeys. My dad ran turkeys back in the in the 60s for grasshopper control. Back when the turkey market was good, they herded them hmm. around. Uh, so I've always kind of wanted to do that. My grandmother always had chickens in the chicken house and, and grazing in the garden. Uh, we're not going to get chickens. Uh, <laughs> not, anytime I, I, soon, I, <laughs> not anytime soon. Uh, Ginger has uh, put the anchor down pretty hard on that. <laughs> Uh, and so now we settle on goats. Uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've started a relationship with a good fr friend now uh, at Mulhall, Orlando area. I helped start cover cropping about three years ago. Ronnie Robinson, a really excellent operator up there that put diversity in shortly thereafter. And he's running large number of cows, large number of goats, and large number of haired sheep together. Uh, very, very good so hmm. that and that's what I tell everybody uh, when I travel to speak a lot of people think I go to teach and share you know how to do it and I tell everybody I, I actually learn more every time I go than what I think I try to teach or share I help Ronnie get started in the cover crops and now he's helping us get started in the diversity in animals. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's a give and take. So we have a lot of conversations. Uh, well, she's the, is she the director of the Garfield County Conservation District now? Your wife, or she was? She, she's she's actually, yeah. On the, the board? She's on the board in Dewey County. Yeah, board, yeah. Yep. She, uh, she took my place. I had to, when I got the presidential uh, appointment, I had to step down. And uh, I knew that uh, the board needs some diversity as well. And I thought Ginger would would be a, a good possibility. That was quite a conversation around the dinner table for, <laughs> for a little while. Uh, but she uh, she accepted and, and they, 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 I think it's been a good good thing. She's, she's learned a lot and is a really, really good, I think doing an excellent job. Was she the first woman to be on, on the board? Probably, yeah. There? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and she likes it. Surprisingly, she likes it. Uh, I didn't know that she would like it as much as she did, truthfully. I knew she would do a good job and, and she would be serious. Uh, but she comes home and we have conversations <laughs> about the board meeting. Uh, she may learn something before you learn it. Sometimes. I mean, that's always a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's been so, very... speaking of the Dewey County Conservation District Board, Jimmy, I would like you to 
address the challenges that the board has in the watershed program and how you some of the issues that arose while you were on the board and some of the the things that are the day-to-day -day challenges of a board member that has a lot of watershed structures in your district yeah you know that's one of the things i didn't realize <clears throat> i knew we had watersheds in the district when i went on the board myself i didn't realize we had as many mm -hmm. as we as we do but quickly learned that uh you know <laughs> we uh being being part of uh, dewey county and and right next to congressman lucas you know frank made a big emphasis on rehab and mm -hmm. watershed program the small watershed programs uh, i was blessed enough to testify once uh, before the committee uh, and so we started down the rehab part of that <clears throat> we had our first project uh, notched out getting ready to put the pipe in and a big rain came uh, and we had we had worked on this emergency action plan for for a period and i actually was the chairman of the board at that time uh never you know it's like you never intend to use an action plan and i'll never forget the call from colita oh my goodness we've got to enact the plan there's people in jeopardy down below the, the coffer dam is about to go over and what do you want us to do and it's just like crud colita i don't know get the plan out and see what we got to do and and uh so you know that was a unique role to move into there it worked out okay the, the coffer dam held uh, god said that's enough <laughs> rain for right now uh, we stretched them a little bit here we'll, we'll stop and uh, that worked out that led us to the next three rehab projects of not notching the dam to mm -hmm. do the jack and bore pipe through uh, which turned out to be a, a really good move uh, forward first of all uh, the integrity of the dam is not compromised by the notch uh, the pipe and grout worked very well and so we've completed a couple more since the, three more since then so we've done four total now i think in dewey county you might explain the difference of those two techniques the notch versus yeah i forget that no that's fine uh originally and i've done a lot of this with with the small ponds and stuff over the years when the corrugated pipe that get rusted out and go to to leak and and cause any erosion in the dam you would take and you would doze all that dirt back off and essentially v-notch it down to the pipe so that you could take the old pipe mm -hmm. out put a new pipe in put all that back and you had to v it at a big uh three to one slope or two and a half to one out so you could get on the equipment so there's a lot of dirt to, to remove mm -hmm. very extensive dirt work to get that done to now they have this ability to bore a hole through the the dam on the incline that you need uh, and then you jack the new pipe in and then you put liquid grout around mm -hmm. that to get the seal uh, so it doesn't leak around it so a jack and yeah. bore and jack through uh, so it was is very good uh, scenario to go to we didn't have the the emergency situation if right. you get a big flood uh, which is always possible in watersheds uh, you know we've learned a lot with with contractors and stuff through our process of uh, starting with the first watershed and then we actually done a watershed that that we rent and operate family farm there right by us uh, so I was sitting on both sides mm -hmm. of the table, uh, which give us a kind of another perspective of sometimes as board members or commission help or NRC help, uh, and, and conservation district that we sometimes don't always put ourselves on the other side of the table. We think we are as producers sitting on a board, but you know, 
I'll never forget, I had a hired hand one time talked about having a little surgery, and I called it a little surgery, and he said, I won't tell you what, Jimmy, there's no little surgery if it's on you. It's, it's the same thing in, in the rehab or conservation practice. It, it may look simple and easy on a piece of paper or spreadsheet or a plan, uh, but if it's on your land and it's being imposed on you, that you need, it, it's different on that side mm -hmm. of the table. So that gives us a good perspective uh, from a board to be have a producer that had a watershed as well. And didn't your board initiate some watershed meetings, uh, dinners with producers that had, around, and you did this around the county just to have that kind of uh, yep. give and take to hear everybody's concerns and sure, we, which I uh, thought was a really uh, a great, a great thing that you initiated. Yeah, we we decided as as you know activities for the year, uh, we need to go around to different parts of the county and. and and, and share that and get feedback. If Ben had a watershed, if, if that come up for rehab, you know, what that might look like yeah. and what, just sharing it. We had experts come in and, and talk about the procedure and, and, and how we would do that. And, you know, a lot came from that it was like, okay, if you drain the lake, what am I gonna do for water? Mm -hmm. uh, we wound up, we've drilled a couple of water wells now and furnished tanks because you know you lose that water supply uh, when you're doing that in a rehab or, or whatever you need to do on lakes or sheds so that was a, a really good part i think that the district really played the, and all the board members were really behind that mm -hmm. we've had a watershed banquet for several years right. we haven't had it in a time now that I, I hear there's some talk about maybe doing that again uh, you know as a board you can do a lot that sometimes you don't think it's that important but it does affect a lot of people and, and in the end that was a really good yeah. move in that what we've done uh, that I'm, I'm proud of our district board they were great when I come on and they're they were great since I've got off uh, because they care uh, and they want to move things forward in mm -hmm. conservation. They're always looking to, you know, how do we do this better? Eastern Red Cedar's been a huge issue in Diddy County and, and, and you know, we talked at several board meetings where every year it's one of the top priorities for cost share, state cost share. It's a big incentive in the EQIP program with uh, NRCS. But it's kind of like working hard. Some days uh, I feel like I just work really, really hard and I look behind me and it's like, I don't see that I've accomplished anything. And and so we sat down as a board and said, you know, we're, this is top priority. Are we making an impact? They seem to be growing as fast or faster than we're cutting them. Yeah. And you know, how do, how do we change that? And, and uh, then when we had the wildfire, uh, there was a, a good, excellent program, I thought, from NRCS about woody debris management or removal. And what that meant was skeletons that is burned and standing, uh, they had a program that would help you get rid of them. And, and that might entail bulldozing, it might entail cutting, mm -hmm. stacking like you would a green tree, or mulching. And I, and I chose mulching because I wanted the carbon on the ground. Uh, I didn't want to destroy the surface any more than mm -hmm. it hadn't been through a dramatic uh, experience itself. Uh, but we quickly learned that that window wasn't large, long enough or large enough. Uh, shortly after the fire, they initiated that. Uh, and, and of course I got in because I was on the board and knew the program, but I also saw the need. Uh, and then when I started mulching and started getting rid of it, the producers like, how do we get in? You done missed it. Yeah. And so we talked to Gary and the, the National Association there, uh, promoted that as well, and, and NRCS looked at it and they opened that back up. We done a second round and got a lot more in. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very big challenge. Uh, 
and, and at that time I was actually in my new role at USDA. So I was, had three different insights to, to that. And uh, part of the issue was if you wait too long after the initial emergency, the fire, then you can't call it an emergency program. Mm -hmm. But I tried to explain to them what I went through is, is you're in a state of emergency, so you're on survival mode. You're trying to figure out how to save your cow herd, save your farm, rebuild your fence and your infrastructure. Then you start thinking about after that's all done, and in our case, 23 miles of fence that had to be rebuilt, move half the cow herd to eastern Oklahoma for a year, try to grow enough to save the rest of the cow herd. You're not worried about a, a dead skeleton tree. Right. Only after you get all that fires put out uh, do you start thinking about that. And that's normally the window is closing. And, and so we fought and fought and I fought to get that second round. I still think they need to change that and have that open for a year or two or three after the initial fire. Uh, can't win them all. Yeah. And that's one of them I couldn't win because of the emergency thing. Mm -hmm. So I think we need different terminology to get there. But uh, yeah, that was quite a deal too. In your time as OACD president, what do you remember about being on OACD's board and being president, what are the issues that you had to deal with? You know, that there's a lot, <laughs> and what, what an opportunity uh, to be a part of a great association. And, uh, you know, we started uh, legislators' uh, dinners uh, to understand, you know, why they should invest in conservation in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Uh, awareness. Uh, we started that, and, and I think that was a good move. Uh, we, we've done a lot of legislative days, tours. Dewey County was one of them that actually would take a bus and take legislators around, show them the watersheds that we were rehabbing, show them brush control. Uh, I, I think that was something that was really good. Uh, one, one of the good things that, that that Trey and I with the commission started was this farm to food bank program. Mm -hmm. uh, Trey and I sat down here one day and, and Trey actually said, I wonder if we could throw some vegetables in a cover crop and you know, it, it, if that would work, if we'd raise some or if we could donate that to someone that needed it. And uh, that really excited me and, and so that led to uh, having a seed company Look at that. We, we, Trey and I planted a garden. It worked. Uh, then we reached out to the regional food bank, said, you know, if we think we can do this on a large scale, uh, could we partner together? That led to an MOU signing. Uh, and that, that next year we had 35 gardens. And uh, myself, Ginger, and, and Carson and I raised a three acre garden for multiple years. Uh, in one day, we picked like 2,500 pounds uh, that went to the local pantries and stuff. And it was a very, very good mm -hmm. part of OACD and uh, give us good visibility. Uh, I, not only, you know, sometimes when we do projects, we, we think of narrow focus, feeding the hungry, the needy, the elderly that shut in. In all actuality, that program done that. That was the main goal that we succeeded. But what it done was also grow the community. So local churches started helping us mm -hmm. come and pick. All companies had programs for community service that I didn't even know about that would allow their employees to come and, and help us pick. Uh, NRCS done the same thing. We had lots of and our CS employees from different counties come and help us pick. So, yes, we did achieve our goal of, of getting some fresh vegetables to needy people that really needed it. But we also grew communities that wasn't even on the, the, the target as we sat down mm -hmm. and talked about the possibilities. Uh, so that's a, a, 
and I'm still getting. I got a, had a call yesterday from a, a lady in Wichita Conservation District up there had been raising gardens, and now they want to interact with the food bank mm-hmm. there, and how we done that. Uh, I helped a, a doctor in California that has made the tie uh, healthy soil, healthy food, healthy humans. Daphne Miller. I had her can't come and talk to No Till on the Plains two years ago. I've helped her or assisted her in starting Milpa Gardens in California for that same reason. Uh, and that all spun out of OACD. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, that was a, a very, very good uh, growing time for Jimmy and, and, and us at OACD and how we stretched. Uh, one of the other projects we worked on was uh, TNC. Uh, was was very interested in soil health and asked me to come and and uh, talk. That's to the Nature Conservancy for those. Yes, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's part of no, no. Me and, and government we're we're world renowned for acronyms <laughs> yeah. that nobody knows what you're talking about. Uh, yes, the Nature Conservancy, uh, and so I went to their. Uh, they don't call them board of directors or trustees, mm-hmm. uh, and and give a presentation to their state trustees. That led to a, a presentation to all their employees uh, and, and their focus in soil health. And so I've done that. That led uh, to their uh, world uh, conference in Nebraska City, uh, enrichment conference, I think is what they call it, uh, to do a couple trainings two years in a row. And I had some calls from some board members at OACD that was wondering, you know, what are you doing? Are you wanting to be on their board or a trustee? And it's like, no, 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 no. You know, I think they'd be a great partner. They're all about conservation. Yeah, but I said, I know, I know. We don't always have to agree with every single item as a partner. If we can agree on conservation, can we work together and achieve both goals? Not in realizing that they're not going to believe everything that we do, and we're not going to accept everything they do. That led to a, a, a phone call from their director that said, if we could raise a million dollars, could you get pollinators on the ground in Oklahoma? And it, of course the answer was yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that project still in phase. Of course, fundraising became a big issue with everything that we've been through in the last couple of years mm-hmm. uh, down the road here. Uh, but we're still in that process. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, growing partnerships uh, and teamwork uh, is very important. And, and I think OACD was has done a re- really good job at that. Uh, so that was a, a very good. Uh, time in my life, uh, being on the board, changed the executive directors in that in that term. Uh, the Leopold Award came along. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, <laughs> that was one of them awkward conversations. I kept telling them, I you know, I need to be a part. I want to be a part of the Leopold, and they kept trying to distance me. And of course, they didn't tell me they were wanting me to be the, the first one, you know, and I was wanting to be a part of it. And of course, I couldn't be a part of it if I was in that process. But uh, what a what a great opportunity it has. And, and the, only, the only thing out of that was I really had my, in the back of my mind, it would be neat to be a part of NACD mm-hmm. uh, as the next stepping stone. And then the opportunity with USDA come along mm-hmm. in the administration that I couldn't turn down. But then that led to a, a opening this year. I'm actually on their climate action task force with NACD okay. uh, and working with the new administration mm-hmm. on climate smart agriculture. Uh, and so that's also led to a couple of conferences in California at their the World Climate Action Task Force mm. uh, Symposium, I think is what they call it. So all that stems out of being, stepping up, being on the local board, uh, 
always looking for another opportunity, like my dad said, never turn down an opportunity and growing. It's not for everybody to do what I've, I've done, uh, but I, I feel like uh, hopefully I've had a, uh, a positive input somewhere amongst that trail. It's not, sometimes things don't always work out that, I mean, we can always paint a big rosy picture, but there's things that we started that, yeah. that did not work. Yeah. Uh, and, and I've told everybody, and then this come from my granddad, and he always talked about leaning into the row when you're chopping cotton. And uh, he said, you'll find that in life if you lean forward and you trip and fall, you always fall forward. If you're overwhelmed and you're trying to back up from something you're scared of, if you fall, you fall backwards. Mm -hmm. So son, always lean into the row. Okay. So that brings us up to what you're doing today. So the after after the 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 stint in uh, being part of the DC crowd and USDA, <clears throat> I came back home, went back to work. Uh, man, I traveled thousands. I think I put like twenty five thousand miles on two vehicles in, in sixteen months. Uh, so I come back home, get my boots back dirty again, <laughs> get back to doing what I love to do, hit home. And then I get a call from Trey at the commission. He said, I'd like for you to come go to work for us. Really? <laughs> okay. Let's talk about it. And he said, I think you really like this. Uh, General Mills uh, had generously uh, give a chunk of money to the commission uh, to put conservation on the ground, soil health, regenerative ag, uh, in a focus of about four counties in Oklahoma. And as would work as a mentoring program uh, where they, you would select a mentor in that county and then that mentor would select three others to work with. So you would have that small nucleus of people working together uh, and normally if you can get that done, we've seen that and then just foster out into a bigger circle. So I like that concept and, and so I said, well, you know, what would I do? Well, you could be in charge of mentoring uh, to do that. And then he says, I really want to grow that into every county eventually if we can, whether it's General Mills or us or whoever. And that really, uh, hit home to me that, okay, maybe that, maybe I'm not done. Uh, so maybe we'll try this. And uh, he's given me a wide, wide latitude and longitude of what I can do. Farm consulting with, with producers as well in that. So we the initial project started with K, Kingfisher, Grant, and Garfield counties. Uh, not all of them are in the program this year uh, due to my not being done with USDA. It, before I could take another job, there's federal rules that you got to go by. Mm. And if I had entertained a call from Trey and if I had uh, interviewed for a job prior to January 20th, I would have to divulge all that in, into the public eye, salary, description, and, and multiple. It says lots of paperwork is the short of all that. So I did not, I told him I could even have a conversation about any of that uh, till after that period. So that actually moved their time frame forward. Mm -hmm. And then time we started meeting with districts. The neat thing about that, this program is it gives the local di conservation district the power uh, to empower themselves, to help select a mentor, to be a part, host field days, uh, and get dollars to do that. Uh, but once again, you got to go through that process. So it's taking applications and then selection. And then once you select that mentor, then he's got to select three. And so that time frame just keeps a spiraling mm -hmm. forward. Uh, so not everybody's got on board. We did have uh, a challenging year. Uh, our, our, mentor in Kingfisher County got his planted. We had a field day 
there. The producer in Garfield County uh, had two great producers, had success. My mentor there had chemical issues, the co-op messed up, uh, putting chemical on, mm -hmm. uh, didn't get his up. Then in the midst of that, setting that field day up, my mentor there uh, encountered uh, coronavirus, uh, very sad event. He did not uh, get over that mm. and uh, passed away. Uh, so that field day's been postponed or delayed till uh, General Mills is coming next, this week, the 16th. And so we're gonna go out and look around and, and see them projects. Grant County, uh, where it always rains in the Garden of Eden, I tell them in, up in that area, <laughs> it did not rain this year. Uh, the cover crops came up and died, half died, three-fourths died. Uh, so once again, it's farming and ranching, uh, but man, what a great opportunity. And, uh, you know, now we're talking about uh, working on legislation for Oklahoma is the next thing to get it passed, uh, for soil health initiative. Uh, Trey and I and, and the soil health team here are very convinced, uh, that we must move forward with that. We, we've got to look at our soil as the infrastructure. We've done a great job at the commission and OACD and in conservation of focusing on watershed program protecting the infrastructure. And we always think about that infrastructure as being roads, bridges, housing. You can lay out infrastructure however you want to, railroad tracks, whatever. But in, in essentially our soil is our, our, our foremost infrastructure. And we've been trying to protect it for years, but we never looked at it that way. Mm -hmm. And so we think that, that we need to start talking about it and promoting it and get the legislature to understand that soil is everything. Without it, we can't have clean water. We can't have good food. We can't have nothing. We can't survive. Not only above ground or below ground. We all... And that's the, the, the really neat thing when you really look at soil health is to understand the complete ecosystem circle that it is. And what I've found is every living creature, microscopic little to an elephant, operates the same way. They all have to have water. They all have to have air. They all have to have food. And... Quite bluntly, they, we all create nutrients in the end out of that cycling process. Everything works that way. We're all created to function the same way. So without taking care of that infrastructure, we're affecting living beings above and below ground in that way. So that's the next endeavor. <laughs> uh, New Mexico uh, led the country in, in the first legislation passed. They have a healthy, whole, healthy soils initiative out there that actually puts funding in for that. Uh, we think that's the next hmm. great step that we can do here. Uh, we have our governor is very uh, forward thinking. He, he, he likes to talk about being the top 10 state. Uh, I think we could be the top one. We already are in, in downstream uh, uh, delisting of streams mm -hmm. uh, in the nation looks to Oklahoma uh, that we are number one. So why not? I, th I think we can be. So that new role has is, is got several opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, another opportunity coming out of that now instead of part-time is full-time maybe a, with the NRCS connection as well. Uh, on some training and whatnot. So that hasn't happened yet. Uh, we're, we're having discussions. Uh, once again, the anchor at home has, <laughs> has, a, has a say in that as well. Uh, so uh, Ginger and I are considering that. With a few health issues she's had, with another shoulder replacement and some back uh, trouble, I've so far stayed part-time, but 
I see the role growing probably down the road. That takes you away from your riding the tractor. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, that's one of them things that you don't sometimes appreciate until you don't have it. And so when I am home, I really enjoy planning, mm -hmm. or, or which Carson normally does all the planning. Uh, and I've done a lot of spraying now. Of course, he does everything, uh, just like I used to do. But I enjoy coming home and putting some biostimulants on sesame uh, this past weekend and, and whatnot, going out and being in the cab and enjoying some of that mm -hmm. uh, as well. It's always a balance between family time and, and work, whatever you do in, in life, and there's got to be that co-mingling of, of all that, and travel trailing and yeah. fishing. Uh, you know, we're not in retirement, not, not, but, you know, we think about that. And we also think about the farm and ranch and, and, uh, you know, often people don't want to think about legacy. Uh, I, I do at, at times and, you know, what's going to happen to the, to the farm, uh, you know, are we going to try to control it beyond the grave? No, we're, we're, we, we're not going to do that. Uh, we believe that we've taught our son and hopefully our grandson the benefit and the beauty of, of conservation and farming and ranching life and lifestyles uh, that even though they may not be come back to the farm, maybe the grandson will, maybe he won't. Probably not, since they live here in the, in the town of full of amenities. That possibility is always there. But we know that they love to hunt and fish. They love the land. Uh, so let's teach them how to select who they might want to farm versus just anybody uh, down the road. And that's not easy conversations because mm -hmm. that's admitting to myself that I'm not going to be here forever. And, and an Emmons has always thought we're going to be here forever. But I, we know that we're not. But uh, so we're starting to have them conversations and how we leave the farm and and uh, let them have the opportunity to do what we've done to control and improve and protect and conserve God's greatest resource. Leave it better than they found it. Yep. Do you have a favorite time on the farm, like during the day or season? I, I love daylight. I, I love listening to the wildlife. I love moving cattle into a new pasture or a new cover crop and you can hear them pulling. It's, it's a little squeak when they pull up and they're just so, they ball, ball, ball when you get there and you open the gate and then just, it's like dinner time <laughs> at home. It goes from a loud roar in the room to just quiet and they're grazing. You hear the quail. Uh, we've got elk on the farm now, and, and early, early every morning you can see them and, and the sun coming up and the deer. I don't even want to talk about feral pigs because that, that's not a beauty <laughs> of wildlife, uh, but there is an opportunity to uh, do some feral pig control sometimes. But of a morning is so so peaceful and so beautiful mm -hmm. now ginger's the opposite she loves the the late evening she's not a morning person so we're i can do both what about smells do you have a favorite time of yeah you know it used to be i love the smell of fresh plowed ground <laughs> <laughs> now it's i love to dig with a shovel and smell that in the no-till and stuff it's actually more rich mm -hmm. uh I, I love harvest time and blooming time uh, prior to harvest. We have honeybees, and I just love to go out there and hear the buzz in the fields and stuff. So there's a lot of sight, sound, smell mm -hmm. of the farm. Uh, I've decided canola blooming's not one of my favorites. <laughs> no, it causes, uh, <laughs> and it's actually not very good honey bees are very aggressive when they're on canola hmm. and mustards. I did not realize that, but uh, it, it's it's like the ultimate 
uh, testosterone high for them or something. They, I mean, it. Huh. They're very aggressive, but no, we we love we love the companion and and the relay cropping. Uh, right now, we've got sesame growing and sweet clover at the same time, so we plant them together. Uh, hopefully, this is first. This is a pilot. Uh, we'll be able to harvest the sesame off, and the clover will be about this tall to surviving. And then a year from now, during wheat harvest next year, then we can harvest the second crop of clover. So one planting, two harvests. So trying to cut costs back, keep multiple things growing. Mm. So it's very rich in smell right now because it's blooming nonstop, the sesame is. So then next year it'll be the clover. Is that what you mean by pollinators on the ground? Mm-hmm. To cut crops? Yeah. Yeah, we do uh, quite a few pollinator strips and stuff. We haven't been as successful with them as other people have. Uh, it's a timing issue that we haven't got perfected yet, but we've been pretty successful, but not not where we want to be. But you have your red cedars under control. We're working on, 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 on our own property, yes, they are under control. We're working on landlords uh, continually. We got uh, four equip projects going on at one time. Uh, we're mulching uh, on two landlords uh, right now, still of the dead trees. One of them also on a green that one of the properties that they had didn't burn, but was infested. We got in, uh, so we're trying to mulch them. And then we got a, the the other landlord I talked about earlier that we rented from a former classmate. They just signed up on a big uh, equip. That we're going to be so we also have a skid steer and a mulcher that side that we're going to get somebody else to help run too. So, <laughs> so yes, lots of lots of multitasking going on right now. So some of them feral pigs. How about go gophers? I don't know if gophers is something that's yeah you know, an issue out there. You know, that's the one thing about holistic thinking and regenerative thinking. I used to poison lots and lots of gophers and alfalfa, they were your enemy. Uh, now we talk about water infiltration points. Uh, and ants, fire ants, uh, or harvester ants, red ants in our area is big. But they're also there for a reason and a purpose. You got to understand. Uh, and so we're trying to be more in harmony with Mother Nature and, and, and wildlife. I haven't found yet why she wants to in, impose feral pigs on us. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, wildlife has come back. Uh, one of our landlords uh, has passed away now, uh, but he didn't understand cover cropping when we started. But he gave me the flexibility to try it on their farm, even though I was paying a cash rent. In uh, the third or the second year in. He come to me and said, I don't understand what you're doing, but I want to tell you something. Me and my children want to come out fishing and hunting. We now have more bob white quail, more turkeys, and more deer than we've ever had. We don't care what you're doing, just keep it up. <laughs> and, and, and so that's really understanding the harmony yeah. of everything. And, and sometimes what we think is a, a, a detrimental thing to the operation where it be pigs or where it be, you know, weeds, whatever. We now look at it and think, okay, is it here for a purpose? Is that purpose a, a benefit to us or a detriment to us? Or can we work in harmony with that mm -hmm. and make that, you know, a plus? And it gets back to that statement I made a while ago. Everything we do on the land has an impact. So instead of spraying the worms that's in the grain sorghum to kill them, even though we, we want to get rid of them worms, is there something we can do that won't kill all the bees and all the pollinators? Can we put molasses and table sugar on to raise the bricks level that a worm and an aphid can't tolerate yet everything else can. 
And yes, you mm. can you can do that. So we're always trying something like that. This week, Sesco came to look at the sesame. Like they can't figure out how come we don't have these any of these new worms that's in there. I said, well, I just put molasses and and some humic and some compost tea on that the other day. Well, you think that will help? <laughs> I don't know. We don't have the worms. You tell me. Yeah. Will they show up tomorrow or the next day? We don't know yet, but that's part of that harmony and figuring out how we can work with it instead of against it. And maybe it won't work against us. So, so if it rains and washes it away, you have to do it again. The neat thing about that is if you get it, so the plants have this ability to capture sunlight, take in oxygen, nitrogen, and then once it's in the plant, then it, it raises the sugar level in the plant. The thing about aphids and worms, they cannot digest high sugar. So if you really think about when pest happens, when it's in your garden or in your field, it's normally when the plants are stressed. And when the plants are stressed, where it's either heat or lack of water or whatever it is, their sugars are low. That's It's, it's kind of like when we, in our bodies, when, when we get under stress sometimes, it triggers your sugars to be high or low. Plants are the same way. So when it, that sugars come down and the, less, this, the stress of the plant is trying to survive, then it makes it susceptible to disease and insects. So healthy soil, healthy plants, it, it, it's really, it's, it's bigger than we ever know. Uh, it's it's that's been the really the toughest understanding is is the bigger picture mm -hmm. that we see. Like I said earlier, we we all tend to think, you know, this is the goals, this is where we're going, but we 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 really need to look at it like this yeah. to really understand that it, it's all in harmony, and how how do we manage that mm -hmm. to be. A benefit to everything, including us. Your science teacher from high school would be proud. Was that one of your favorite subjects? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And actually, um, yeah. I've, I've, they've been to the farm a couple of times, uh, mm -hmm. and actually, I'm going to do a class uh, for them this year. I've actually been to uh, West Texas A and M, uh, two of their colleges twice, uh, to teach a like a day course. Mm. Uh, on that, which I, I find that funny, a day course. I never knew a course <laughs> could be that short, or I wouldn't have went to college. But, uh, so yeah, I mean, it's 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 and and the thing about it is, I I don't know near near enough yet, but uh, we're we're learning enough to to be dangerous to to know that that there it, this is a big picture thing mm -hmm. and we've got to understand that it's not just about raising a crop or building a terrace or building a pond or building a watershed that you know it's everything above all that and every living thing that's in that watershed is going to be affected by this lake or by this terrace or by this structure or this cropping system or this grazing management and how all this can work together to save lives and save infrastructure down below st stream and how all that can be in harmony together. So. Yeah, well, I know I'm personally thankful you're out there fighting the good fight. <laughs> well, not everybody is, but we, we want to hope that the majority uh, of what we've done is, is received okay. Uh, down the road and, and to be a part of the conservation family uh, I, I don't know how you could you could leave a better legacy mm -hmm. excellent and one more thing Andrew, if we were to look in the back of your truck what would we find what a do you shovel. always have with you a shovel a shovel <laughs> uh, parked out there today you'll find two shovels some seed samples that we're archiving uh, in the General Mills project, we're going to try to prove uh, as soil gets better, the crops will get better, the higher protein, 
so we, I wanted archive soil, which I didn't do in my project. And that's, there's about 10 of us across the country, probably 50 if you really want to count everybody that wishes we'd archived in, in jars in sequence so you could actually see it on the mm -hmm. shelf or wherever. Mm -hmm. And so that's the first thing I told Trey and, and, and uh, Amy that we want to archive the grains and the soils in this project. And yeah. hopefully down the road somewhere else, somebody will say, wow, glad they thought of that. Yeah. Visuals help. Yeah. yeah. You know, one of, the, one of the things that we're talking about microbiology, Dr. Haney, Rick Haney of the Haney test and I are really good friends. He grew up just in eastern part of Dewey County. Uh, he took soil samples that had been archived for 40 years and took them out and wed them and looked under her microscope and it still had activity in it. Hmm. In a jar, in a freezer, in a storage container for 40 years. 40 years. So it's truly amazing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the new tools that he's coming out with that can measure the population by the CO2 that they respirate is, is, is just amazing. And, and now we're learning that we can also measure uh, the temperature and help figure out the population because of the scenario I talked about a while ago. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, the big picture item is, is the big picture. Mm -hmm. and, and, and how Oklahoma conservation can be the leader in that is, is truly amazing. Where we've come from being established in the 30s out of the Dust Bowl and, and the great things we've done then of actually diverting the resource to now embracing the resource instead of diverting the water or diverting the wind. How can we grow crops to do all that and to benefit the big cycle? So yeah. what a what a wonderful progression and, and Hugh Hammond Bennett and Aldo Leopold, you know, the forefathers that had the great vision, you know, we ask about my grandfather, you know, what would they think where conservation's at today? Mm-hmm. I think they'd be pretty pleased. Yeah. I don't know how they couldn't be. Right. Maybe they don't understand everything we're doing. <laughs> we don't understand everything just yet either. Yeah. But we're trying, just like they did. Yeah. Anything else? Then my last That's, question is, how do you want to be remembered? Just as Jimmy. <laughs> just Jimmy? Okay. You know. They're, Not the soil expert guy, huh? You know. <laughs> They're, they're going to tag all them labels on. Uh, I've been the call of soil guru, Hollywood, whatever. <laughs> uh, I worked very hard at trying to, trying to stay humble. And, and just Jimmy, the guy that cared. Okay. Well, that's a good way to end. Thank you for sharing with us yeah. today. It's been great. Great time.